All right. Uh, thanks. Thank you all again for coming out today. Uh, you know, I, I'm still hopeful the weather will part a little bit so we can look at uh, some of the moons that uh, Emily talked about. But uh, but if even if we didn't, the talks have been great. Dan, thank you so much for coming out with your your uh, your briefing and, and and Dr. Martin as well. Our last brief here. You know, Emily talked about the weirdness in our own solar system, and we have Dr. Barkley now is going to talk about the weirdness outside of our solar system. And, uh, you know, you can't almost turn on one of these science ch shows these days without having at least one episode in a series dedicated to exoplanets. It is, it is so, such a topical uh, um, topic right now, that, with great, great public appeal. So it's terrific to have uh, Tom here today. Um, Tom works up at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He's done a lot of his work on Kepler uh, and uh, now TESS, the TESS mission, uh, doing the coolest things. I mean, uh, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but you were on part of the, t the team that discovered so far the smallest or nearly the smallest mm -hmm. exoplanet in the habitable, habitable zone. I mean, can you imagine we're standing here looking at a planet outside of our solar system that could be uh, Earth-like, and, and Dr. Barclay was part of that discovery. Um, I think you were awarded NASA's uh, uh, Meritorious Service Award for, for, for part of that work, and uh, it's, it's terrific to have you here. Got his PhD from the uh, University of L College in London, London, England, and uh, we're delighted to have you, so please welcome Dr. Tom Barclay. Thanks everyone, it's really lovely to be here. Um, and I think actually the talk that came before was really interesting uh, and kind of led the way to some of the stuff I'm talking about. Um, learning about our own solar system is absolutely vital to understanding other planetary systems. And in fact, um, the early years of exoplanets, that's the study of planets around other stars, was kind of dominated by people who are really good at discovering planets, but not necessarily good at characterizing and understanding them and it wasn't until we started working much more closely with our colleagues in earth science and planetary science that we realized some of these kind of wishful thinking ideas that we, the, the discoverers had into how atmospheres work were completely wrong and, and kind of broke the laws of basic laws of physics um, and now I think th the study of planets around other stars is really progressing very rapidly particularly on the sort of theoretical side of of what might atmospheres like be like what might the surfaces be like and the composition of these planets be like because of the things we've learned from planetary science and the study of our own solar system um, so it's, it's it's a very exciting as we have this crossover between learning about things near to us and things so much further away so kind of in the early days of exoplanets we expected to find planetary systems that looked pretty much like this now this is a star just like the sun well, we, so the one planetary system we knew of orbited a sun-like star, so that sounds like a pretty good place to place to start. Um, we had, let's see if this works. There we go. Um, the inner planets are small and rocky. They have don't have thick hydrogen and helium atmospheres. They can kind of have no atmosphere or very thin atmospheres. Um, and they're, they're all relatively small. And then as you go further out, you have the, the giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And between them, you can have had bands of asteroids. Um, so when we went to look for other planets around other stars, this is what we we're expecting to see. And kind of we designed our experiments to find these kind of things. And in fact, it took such a long time for us to discover planets around other stars simply because this is what we designed our experiments to look for. And if we'd opened our minds a little bit and thought there might be such a much bigger diversity out there, we could have found them 20 or 30 years before we did. We just didn't use the, experiment, the equipment we had to look for them because they weren't where we expected them. Kind of the revolution began in kind of the late 80s, uh, early 90s um, with the discovery of kind of the first planets. These were extremely strange and like nothing like we ever expected. The first planets didn't orbit a star, a regular star. They orbited a neutron star. Uh, these were the pulsar planets. Extremely weird and unlike, truly unlike anything we expected to find and truly unlike anything in our own solar system. A pulsar is a, 
is basically a a dead star, an extremely dense environment, highly magnetically active. The planets around them really are more just sort of planetary mass bodies. Probably they 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 weren't formed like planets. They're just the debris left over from a supernova. But but that was kind of the discovery of the first time we found something with the mass of a planet. Really, the revolution happened, or the the moment where everything changed with the discovery of 51 Peg B, uh, 51 Pegasi. Um, this is the first planet we found orbiting a star like the Sun. Very similar. It was a Jupiter-sized planet, so all good. The first planets we expected to find were around a Sun-like star, Jupiter in size. What we didn't expect is them to orbit their star every three days. And that primarily is why it took so long to find them, because who thought of looking for a Jupiter around a, orbiting a star every three days? Now we know this kind of class of planets as the hot Jupiters. And for the first sort of 10 years of exoplanets, basically everything we found was a hot Jupiter. That's not because they're common. In fact, the hot Jupiters are exceptionally rare. Probably somewhere around 1 in 200 stars has a hot Jupiter, maybe even a little lower than that. Um, we found them because they are absolutely the easiest things to find. And that's kind of a little lesson for us in statistics. Um, and a lesson for some, some of our theoretical colleagues who we found lots of these and then they came up with wonderful models to form them around every single star. Now we know they're extremely rare. But, um, but this was the first thing we found um, up until about 1998. Uh, um, we knew of about 20 of these. Um, and that helped to kickstart the, the understanding of these kind of planets. Um, as we moved on, we were able to find things. We were able to find more hot Jupiters. We actually found some sort of Jupiter things much more like Jupiter on kind of Ju Jupiter-type orbital periods around their stars. Um, but we didn't know of anything small particularly. We might know of a few things, kind of Neptune size, maybe a little smaller than Neptune. But that was about it. Um, then everything changed when we went to building a dedicated planet finder um, and putting it in space. So NASA's first dedicated planet finder was the Kepler spacecraft, launched in 2009 from, uh, from Kennedy Space Center. Um, Kepler was launched with a mission of finding planets like Earth around sun-like stars and moreover discovering the frequency of those. So the kind of the f we think of exoplanets in, in sort of three phases. The first phase of exoplanets was learning, do they exist? The second phase was like, okay, well, we know they exist, but what's their diversity like? What Are they common? Are they rare? What types of planets are common? What type of planets are rare? Um, learning all this. Up until 2009, we didn't know if we were the only Earth-sized planet, us and Venus, the only Earth-sized planets in our own, in, in the galaxy. That all changed after we launched this. Um, the kind of, as we go on, the third kind of decade of exoplanets is all about understanding the, the planets in detail and characterizing them. So this is the Kepler spacecraft down here. Um, it's about the size of a school bus, maybe a little smaller than a school bus. Um, it has a meter-sized mirror, so it's a pretty serious piece of glass we put in space there. Um, and it orbits around the sun, not around Earth. Basically, we kicked it out the back of Earth and it, it goes around the sun, kind of following Earth around. Um, it for four years of its mission, stayed at one part of the sky for the entire time. This small fraction of the sky, roughly the size of, I guess, if you put your hand up and hold it out, it's about that size uh, on the sky in the Northern Hemisphere, um, in the constellations of Lyra and Cygnus. This is definitely the right audience for this. <laughs> So wh why did we put it up there, and, and, and what are kind of the, the, the secrets of, uh, of Kepler, and why would we stare in one spot? Well, we use the transit technique to find planets. The transit technique is, is, is beautiful because, unlike most things in science, the technique's extremely, extremely straightforward, both to explain and actually, you know, in some ways to do. You need extremely precise instruments, but the, the measurement isn't all that hard. Um, this is the star. This happens to be the sun, but it can be any star. And the black dot here is a planet. So if a planet's aligned with you just right, you'll see a transit. And so that's what the transit shape looks like. Um, so what you're seeing there is, is we don't resolve the stars. All we see is a, 
one dot of light and then the light gets slightly dimmer and so though and then we measure the brightness of that star so those yellow lines there are just time against brightness so for a small planet we get a, a, di a small dip and for a big planet we get a deep dip okay so that tells us we need to, some we need to put something in space to detect it that's sensitive to detecting the size of those dips the second thing we need to do is we need to put something in space that's going to look for a long, long time. That's because we only see these transits when they pass, the star passes, planet passes in front of the star. So that happens once a year for, for the planet on the planet's year. So if we go around very quickly, we'll see one of those every few days, say if it's got a two-day orbital period. If it's got looking for things like Earth, we'll see one of those dips every year. So that means you've got to catch that 12-hour period that happens every 365 days in order to catch the transit. We'll actually want to see several transits so we can measure what the orbital period is of that planet. So that means looking for multiple years and looking at just the right, catching the right time to catch it. So the reason we stare at, with Kepler, that single part of that sky, is because we want to catch, we want to look at a lot of stars, we want to find the stars that are aligned with their disk just right to catch that transit and we want to stare for a long, long time. And that's what we did. Uh, here's a nice example of kind of how, how sensitive your instrument needs to be. So this is the sun uh, with some beautiful sunspots there. There's uh, Jupiter. So Jupiter, is, uh, in its radius is about the tenth the size of the sun. Um, the way the transit technique works is you're blocking some light. So you're actually blocking area. So a tenth the size, you, an area, you s literally square the radius there. So you square both radii and you get the transit depth that that would cause is a 1% dip in brightness. And that's, that's exactly what we see. So 1% dip in brightness is, is challenging, but it's about what you can do with um, kind of a university level telescope kind of on the roof of the University of Maryland or the University of Maryland's observatory. Th th they're achieving between half a percent and one percent typically I I is doable. So, so that's the kind of thing you can do from the ground fairly readily. It's tough, but it's not, 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 not impossible. Um, going smaller than Jupiter is hard and then that's why you need sensitive instrumentation. This is Earth. Earth would cause about a 100 part per million drop in brightness. So which is, you think of that, for every million photons coming off this star, you're only blocking 100. That's extremely challenging. Um, and you're only seeing that block for about 12 hours every year if you want to find Earth. So it's a hard measurement to make, but, it, but, but it's not a complex conceptual measurement to make. And if you want to go smaller than Earth, I think they're even more challenging. This is the transit of Mercury much, much smaller than the star spot, a sunspot you see there. Um, we've actually used Kepler to find a, a few Mercury-sized planets, so that kind of measurement is possible, though challenging. Oop, that happened much faster than I was expecting. There we go. So this is showing that Kepler field there, that kind of part of the sky that we observed. And this is showing where all the planets we found. In total, we found over 4,000 planets with Kepler um, all across that small part of the sky. That's extremely exciting. If you think all we're sensitive to is planets that are aligned with us just right so that their disks uh, align up with ours. Um, the probability of a random planet to transit a random star, a, a star is somewhere between 1% to you know, a tenth of a percent. So the vast majority of things aren't transiting. And then you think we're looking at that tiny part of the sky. And then we're not even sensitive to transits of most of the smallest planets, yet we still found thousands of planets. What that teaches us is that planets are everywhere. Planets are extremely common. We actually know that planets, there are very likely more planets than there are stars. So that means more than 100 billion planets in our galaxy. Oh yeah, so everything's in our galaxy, everything's relatively nearby. Um, I'll show you some images later about, about where these kind of fall in our galaxy. Um, most of the things we found were actually between the size of kind of Earth um, and Neptune. We call these kind of super Earth, mini Neptunes, that kind of thing. Um, the reason we kind of divide out super-Earths and mini-Neptunes is that um, 
we now know that roughly uh, when you get to about between, say, Mars size and about 50% bigger in radius than Earth, your things are probably kind of have a rocky surface, have um, atmospheres somewhat similar to Earth's, maybe a little bit denser, but, but not wildly different. They're kind of a decent place that maybe we could hope to one day search for life. Once you get about 50% bigger than Earth, um, you become, you start to have lots of hydrogen and helium. You don't have that rocky surface. You become rem resembling much more like the giant planets in our own solar system. And they're not good places, probably, to search search for life. Life might be there, but they're not somewhere where we could readily find life, we think. So that's kind of how, why we divide these up. It's kind of hand wavy a little bit. And the, the boundary between them changes as we learn more about planetary systems. Um, for me, I think the most exciting thing is what we learned about multi-planet systems. So up until Kepler, I think everything or almost everything we found was just, there was, we only found one planet orbiting each star, and certainly transiting each star. After Kepler, we found all these multi-planet systems. There's about, in this movie, there's about 500 um, uh, star systems that we know of more than one planet. They're all quite dense, quite compact. You can see the kind of solar system up there, um, which is much, much more spread out. And that's simply because we're sensitive to planets close in. They transit more quickly. Um, but you can see we have planets where they have big planets inside, big planets outside, small planets inside. They lo look completely different. There's no kind of real um, scheme here of small planets in, in the inner solar planetary system. Um, large planets further out like we see in our own system. They're all completely different. Um, and I think this just shows you the extreme diversity in, in how planetary systems look. And it tells us that there are multiple ways that planetary systems form. It's pretty mesmerizing. Um, the other thing that we, we learn is, is we assumed that the best places to look for planets are stars like the Sun. In fact, we thought the smallest stars would probably not be great places to look for planets because small stars probably have only a small amount of material that kind of left over from, planet, from star formation. They probably don't have enough mass to make a lot of planets. Well, that was completely wrong. We learned that the smallest stars, the red dwarfs, the M dwarfs, are actually have the most planets. They have far more planets, probably two and a half to three times as many planets as stars like our sun have. And in fact, M dwarfs, red dwarfs are becoming the most important places to search and study planets. Um, because they're the stars are small, they're the easiest places to find and study planets. Um, we found planets all the way from much larger than Jupiter, maybe 50% to twice the size of Jupiter, um, all the way down to kind of moon-sized. The smallest planet we know is roughly the size of the moon. Um, and they orbit everything from the smallest stars up to stars about twice the size of, twice the size of, of the sun. And uh, once you get much bigger than that, it becomes very hard to find the planets. So maybe they're there, we just, we haven't found them yet. Oh. Okay, so, so Kepler was a phenomenal success. Um, one of NASA's most successful missions. In fact, despite being, you know, much, much less expensive than some things like Hubble, um, it's up there with Hubble in terms of the, the kind of the number of publications coming out, the, the, the really the impact that it's had on science and the impact it's having on the public. It's really been a profound change in our understanding of the, 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 the galaxy and, and what's around us. Um, what Kepler did well is teaching us frequency, fr teaching us demographics of planets, what it didn't do a great job of is finding the best planets to study as we move forward. We put other things up in space and, and build big telescopes on the ground to study planets. What we really didn't find is many things extremely close to us. And that's because of the way Kepler worked. Um, Kepler was staring at that one part of the sky. There's only so many nearby stars in that one part of the sky. So while 
so most planets Kepler found were, you know, somewhere between 100 and 300 light years away, and some of them are up to a thousand light years away. They're extremely, extremely far away. Now that we know planets are extremely common, we can go and build something to look around our nearest stars, knowing for a fact that most of those nearby stars are going to have planets. And so that, that's why we built TESS. TESS's job is to find the best planets to study with ground-based and other space-based telescopes. And it's, the job is to find our nearest uh, neighbors orbiting the brightest stars. So this is TESS. This was it in the clean room. Um, and the, uh, a few months before launch, um, this is the one time that the solar arrays were were um, extended, uh, tested, and then put back again uh, to, to, to have the second time they're tested actually when we're on orbit. Um, and there are some engineers there. Uh, TESS is about the size of kind of, uh, we've worked hard at this analogy, but we think a joint washer dryer is about right. <laughs> Um, but pr maybe in kind of an industrial scale one. It's, it's, about, it's, a, it's about the height of me. I'm a little bit shorter than I am. Um, the engineer on the, the there is, is six foot six, so um, he's, he's much taller than I am. Um, but this is it in the clear room. It's actually, you know, it's, it's, it's much smaller than, than Kepler. Um, but that's because it doesn't need to be that big. It's looking at bright stars. Kepler was looking at fainter stars, so we needed a lot, a lot more glass. Um, there you see TESS, uh, this was when it was at uh, Kennedy, um, at the SpaceX facility where we were launching on a SpaceX Falcon 9. Um, there's SpaceX fairing, um, TESS is quite small. <laughs> uh, uh, that's, all it, that's all it took. We used actually, TESS was the only, um, the only payload launched on this. Um, normally you'd, you'd do ride shares on this kind of, this kind of thing. Um, but TESS, as I'll show you, is going to a, quite an unusual orbit and no one else wanted to go to the same orbit we're going to. And, I, and we needed a lot of the, a lot of the fuel from, from, the, from the rocket to get us up there. But that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, TESS is also, it doesn't have covers over the lenses. So a very interesting story is, um, I think interesting. Uh, so the fairings, they arrive in two different parts. Um, and then they get put together. But as they're putting them together, they, you know, they're never built exactly to fit. So someone goes at the top and kind of trims down the edges. And so someone was going up there just ready to kind of trim down the edges. And we're like, whoa, you're going to drop all this kind of material down our lens right into the, yeah, right, right into the cameras there. Um, Fortunately, just in time, we managed to stop them and they moved it over to the corner of the room and someone with basically a vacuum cleaner was holding it over as they, as they trimmed it. Yeah. So Tess has four cameras, um, one, two, three, four, um, and I'll show you what they're, what they're like. Each of them, they're small, they're just 10 centimeter. Um, they're, uh, they're a lens system. Uh, so here's the launch on April 18th of last year. Uh, for me, probably, the, actually without doubt, the most exciting day of my career. Um, I worked on Kepler after Kepler launched. Um, and so when my motivation for moving to the East Coast was to work on TESS pre-launch. Uh, so I could work on, and work on it and go and see it in the clean room and, and work on that. And so I was about four miles away on the balcony watching that. Um, and one of my colleagues in Kepler drew this picture of to celebrate Kepler and Tess, friends in space. <laughs> All right. Okay, and this is the last view we ever saw of Tess. This is Tess leaving the, um, the SpaceX uh, fairing. Um, that's just the last picture um, till it's gone forever. Um, and uh, off to do its science mission. After that, we just have uh, images from the cameras and we have uh, telemetry from, from the various parts of the telescope and parts of the spacecraft. So this is what it ho at this right now probably looks like up in space. So as I mentioned, there's four cameras. Each of these four cameras looks at a different, they're kind of aligned, so they look at a different part of the sky 
all kind of stacked up one on top of another. Uh, each field of view is 24 by 24 degrees. So these are extremely wide field cameras. Um, and so in total, by stacking four of them, you have 96 by 24 degrees. So that's about 5% of the sky. Um, we, we image a, a single point in time. Uh, each one of these um, cameras is made up of uh, four uh, 2K by 2K arrays. So that's 4K by 4K on each camera. Uh, and this is roughly what we see inside a camera um, for scale. So it's most of, most of Orion would fit in inside one camera. So it's, it's very large, kind of unprecedented. Um, for, for, for reference, Kepler's field of view w uh, would, is just a little bit bigger than one, one of these detectors. Uh, and the way TESS is observing is that the idea is that we want to map almost the whole sky. So the first year, which we completed in July, we observed the southern hemisphere. And then we move around and we're observing the northern hemisphere. Each of these things we call observing sectors um, is a month long. And so we collect a month data on most of the sky. And then as you get kind of nearer the ecliptic poles, you collect more data. So if you're a star right at the pole, we collect about a year's worth of, of data. For things further away, we collect um, uh, uh, 27 days. And I'll show you why 27 days is the amount of time. We're currently in the third northern hemisphere observing sector. We're observing, we're definitely observing the constellation LAC, which is, yes, Lacerda, because um, we're observing a famous flare star called EV LAC, which is in there. Um, we're in this really strange orbit. So I mentioned we're the only uh, payload uh, going up. Let's see if that'll work again. We're only payload on the spacecraft, uh, SpaceX launch. Um, that's because we're, we're in this two-to-one resonance with the moon. So as the moon goes round once, we go round twice. And so there's kind of a, a nice thing about being this part of the, in this two-to-one resonance. It means that most of the time we can be very far away from the Earth. And then because we're in an eccentric orbit, very, very elliptical orbit, we, get, we then swing close by the Earth. We downlink all our data because we have high bandwidth close to the Earth. And then we can move out again into cold space far away from the Earth, far away from kind of Earth shine and all, all these uh, effects um, staring, at, staring at that part of the sky. So I mentioned kind of TESS's role is to look at the nearby stars. So this is kind of where Kepler was searching at that one kind of cone out from the Earth. Let's see. Oh yeah, there we go. Tessa's search area, instead of being a single cone covering uh, one four hundredth of the sky, Tess in its first two years is going to cover about 85% of the sky. And we've just been extended to carry on for another two years after that. And so we'll be up above 95% of the sky um, after the end of kind of four years. So that's really, other than just being able to search for planets, that's telling, we're going to be able to have this map all the stars and how variable all the stars are on month-long timescales for almost the entire sky. <laughs> yes, so the one of the questions, are we going to rotate tests? We actually are. So tests, we look in the north and we look in the south, there's actually a 12 degree gap along the ecliptic where we don't observe. Um, there's a good reason why we don't observe the ecliptic most of the time, and that's because um, we'd have the Earth passing through our cameras very often. And Earth doesn't do any damage to our cameras if we, you know, we image Earth, but it's extremely bright and basically we can't take any data. Um, but if you get the right time of year, you don't get any Earth, Earth eclipses. And so um, we're going to do that in 2021, looking at the ecliptic. So yeah, so, so Kepler, as I mentioned, one four hundredth of the sky, uh, roughly 3,000 light years away are the planets. Tessa's, that would have said, looking at all of the sky, um, but only for 27 days. There we go. And we're looking at th things within 300 light years, so much, much closer by. Let's go. 
Um, and so that, that allows us to kind of map planets in our local backyard. This is looking for our, for our nearest neighbors. So really, we want to find the planets, ideally, around Alpha Sen. But uh, if we have to go a little bit further than that out, somewhere you know, in, in the kind of um, 15 light year range, that's what we want to find. These are going to be stars orbiting the, the brightest planets orbiting the brightest stars, the ones we get the most photons for, the ones we can study in the most detail. So if you look at kind of, this is looking 80 light years from the sun, this is all the planets we, we know of. And you'll notice that a lot of these, all the stars that we know of, you notice that most of these stars are, up to, are, are colored red on this. As I kind of mentioned earlier, M dwarfs, red dwarfs, are the, they host the most planets. Actually about 70% of the stars in the sky are red dwarfs. Um, that means that they're the most common stars, they have more planets than all the others. Most planets in our galaxy orbit M dwarfs. We know that. So if we want to go and study planets really well, we want to know about the diversity of planets in our galaxy, we better know pr a lot about these planets around M dwarfs. Fortunately, they're also the easiest ones to study because the, planets, the stars are small. The depth of our signal depends on the size of the star. The smaller the star, the bigger the signal we detect. And so we're really focusing on finding planets around these M dwarfs and studying them. And I'll mention some of the things we're going to use to study them a little bit later. All right. So one of my favorite systems that we recently announced uh, a few months ago was the L9859 system. So this is a, a star just 30 light years away, 10 parsec away, and we found three planets orbiting this system. All, th all three planets are roughly Earth size. One of them's smaller than Earth, one of them's maybe 50% bigger than Earth. Um, this is a wonderful system because the planets orbit a very small star. We're going to get great data from these planets. Um, and we also have, because we have three of them, we can kind of start to do what our solar system colleagues have been doing forever and comparing different comparative planetology, comparing them. Why, do, why does the inner planet look different from the outer planet? And so actually later this year, maybe next year, we're going to be us using the Hubble Space Telescope to see if we can try and see an atmospheres on, on these planets. Um, one of these, all these planets are relatively hot. In fact, TESS really isn't designed to look at habitable zones. It might be able to do a few planets in there, but TESS is about finding great things to study, um, but most of them are going to be hot things. The coolest one in this system, for example, still receives four times the amount of energy we receive. Um, uh, absolutely everything we show in exoplanets is hypothetical, like, like artist conceptions. For a very small number of planetary systems, um, m do we know something about the color of the planets? Um, we have you know, a, a spectral information on them, um, but very few, and almost all of those are giant planets. Some giant planets we know about, for example, the Rayleigh scattering, so we know whether they'll have blue skies or not. Um, some of them we know if they've got kind of deep absorption bands, but that's, that's about it. Um, right now, we're really absolutely guessing um, of what they might look like. Um, we know so, some of them we know about the density, and, and some of them we know if they have atmospheres, that kind of thing. But we're really, really at a very early stage. Um, this is the first TESS image, or, or at least the first one we thought ni was nice enough to put out to the public. That's a much more accurate statement. Um, so. Does anyone know much in this, uh, s some of the things in this image? Um, right in the center of our camera four. So remember, I said that these were stacked up, and camera four here is pointing almost at the ecliptic pole the whole time. So that's the obviously the LMC and the SMC there. Um, we collect the LMC. In fact, we, we finished now. We've got an entire year's worth of imaging of the LMC. Oh, the LMC, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Oh, I keep pressing that and it keeps... Um, the Large Lang Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. Um, here's various other bright things in our field of view. So we get an image like this one um, every 30 minutes we collect, and, that's, and we're actually integrating that entire 30 minutes. So we get an image every 30 minutes of this huge part of the sky for an entire month, and we move to the next part of the sky 
and continue and con continue and continue. So we get 48 of these images a day. Let's see. Okay, so Tess, Tess is finding planets already. Um, we have about 30 confirmed planets so far. This is, I think, our first planet. It was very exciting. Pymen C. Pymen uh, is extremely bright star, at least bright for us. It's about fifth magnitude or so. Um, most planets orbit stars much, much fainter than this. This is, I think, the second brightest transiting uh, star with a transiting planet around it. Um, it's extremely hot. But this is going to be a wonderful thing to study as we move forward because it orbits such a bright star. Uh, our kind of second planet we found from TESS, LHS 3844, um, it, it orbits an M dwarf. So the, the question was what kind of dip in brightness would this, this, this um, planet cause? So the star's pretty much like the sun. Uh, the planet is I think it's two and a half times the size of Earth. So we're talking something around 500 parts per million. I thought maybe, maybe less than a millimagnitude, so less than one part in a thousand. Um, so, very, very yeah, so that this, this measurement would be extremely difficult to do, f difficult to do from Earth. Um, kind of the, the shallowest transit, I think, ever done from ground-based telescopes I is about 500 parts per million. So it, it's possible but extremely challenging and um, while earth earth ground-based telescopes can do some of these extremely precise measurements um, what they can't do is find these extremely small transits you need to use some of the big extremely t stable telescopes that just look at one star in order to to measure these transits and we're actually doing that once once tests think we think we found something with tests we use ground-based telescopes to kind of follow up and confirm these planets uh, this is uh, one of my favorite planets orbiting an M dwarf we discovered uh, late last year. Um, it orbits its star every 11 hours. This is so it's, this is a, a, a Earth-sized planet. It's rocky. It almost certainly has some kind of a, a molten surface. Um, and in fact, we've actually managed to get data that shows that this planet has no atmosphere and has a ro molten rocky surface. Uh, we've got infrared images and we've measured the infrared light coming off the planet itself, not just light blocked from the star. So so the the way we the way we measure planets is is literally we, we, we look at the block uh, decrease in starlight. So so this this planet it's a little bit luminous because it's it's thermal radiation coming off it. Um, but that amount of brightness is extremely tiny compared to the, yeah, it's extremely small. Um, this image we had earlier uh, and also updated on the same day, so we're both extremely uh, keen to, to make sure we're, we're accurate. But wh what I wanted to point out here is um, while we've, we've confirmed, we've found about 29 planets, um, we have 1100 candidate planets already just from our first year. So what it tells you is it's a lot harder to get to the 99% confidence level than it is to get to a 90% or so confidence level that you found a planet. So the candidates, roughly 90% of them are going to be real planets. So we probably have you know, over 900 planets there already found. But to take the step to confirming them requires huge investment in time using ground-based telescopes and other space-based telescopes to s convince us that the signals we see aren't caused by some other phenomenon, usually astrophysical in nature, things like eclipsing binary stars masquerading as planets. So all, all these candidates will have had three transits. The vast majority of these candidates have orbital periods less than 10, ten days. Um, the nature of things is te Tess's planets go around their star very quickly because that's what we're sensitive to. Um, How does the, how does what we found affect the Drake equation? Well, so the the Drake equation has various terms in it, and we're learning some of the terms. We're learning, you know, how frequent stars are, how frequently stars form planets. We're learning something about how frequent planets are in habitable zones. We don't know 
whether those planets are habitable we're trying to learn that but we do know about that and i i, I think what we do is we're trying to knock off terms in the drake equation to try and understand are there habitable places out there um, so once we find the planets, and the reason we built TESS is to follow them up. So we can use other NASA assets and other in space to study these planets, and that's really key. Um, things like pictured here are the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer, um, Kepler, and James Webb. So we're going to use NASA's other telescopes to really teach us about these planets we find. Um, Spitzer, unfortunately, will be ending its life in January of next year. Uh, it's an infrared telescope that serviced NASA for um, a long time, teaching us about many things, but particularly about exoplanets in recent years. Um, the data that we got on that LHS, the planet around an M-dwarf, teaching us about the, the molten surface and the lack of an atmosphere came, came from Spitzer. Um, but fortunately, we have new things coming along. Hubble's still up there operating, and the James Webb Space Telescope will hopefully be up there within a couple of years. Uh, this is James Webb when it was um, at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, I was fortunate enough to see James Webb when it was in its clean room at Goddard. Uh, it's now out in California having final integration and testing at uh, Northrop Grumman. Um, everything's going well, so it looks great, and it, things are on uh, schedule for a launch in early 2021. Um, this is what TESS looks like. This is actually the actual size of TESS compared to James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, TESS has 10 centimeter aperture, 10 centimeters about that. Um, James Webb has a six and a half meter mirror. And so we find things with TESS, but we learn all about these planets with James Webb. And so we like to think of TESS as the finder scope for James Webb. Uh, the way, what, basically, what we're doing, as I mentioned, kind of, you know, planets block light, planets block starlight. That's how we know how big a planet is. But they also, some of that light is going to pass through the atmosphere of these planets. A very, very small amount, but if there's an atmosphere there, some of it's going to pass through. So some of that light is going to be absorbed by the planet, because, say, we have oxygen or carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide or methane. If you've got that in your atmosphere, a particular wavelengths of light are going to be absorbed. Where you don't have absorbers, that light's going to pass through. That means the planet's going to look bigger at some wavelengths than it is at others. And so by measuring how big that planet appears at different colors of light, we can learn about what's in an atmosphere. And so that's what James Webb will be able to do. That's really key because right now, we can kind of look at these three planets, which aren't to scale, um, and we know nothing about what they're like. If we see, v to us, v to, to Kepler and Tess, Venus looks the same as Earth, and we know they're a little bit bigger than Mars, but that's about it. We, we actually, if we looked at an exoplanetary system, we'd think Venus would be a fantastic candidate to kind of follow up and study and, and maybe to look for life. But we're pretty sure Venus isn't a good place to look for life. Um, so what we do, we, we look at that light, we look at that light coming from the star, we break up the light into colors, we measure a spectrum. And that spectrum is kind of key. This is kind of one figure just showing you, if you look at different wavelengths of light, the key kind of takeaway from this is that Earth looks different from Mars, looks different from Venus. So if we have extremely high, these great data, perhaps James Webb's not going to give us exactly this data, but it's going to kind of give the hints of what this data would look like. We can learn things about the planets. You now you see here kind of a really nice thing. You see, we know the color of the sky on Earth because of the Rayleigh scattering. If we look at exoplanetary systems, we're going to be able to measure that kind of Rayleigh scattering and know wh what kind of color their sky is. We see absorption bands here, and we, we know there's, we'll be able to see water in atmospheres. What, um, same with CO2, perhaps methane as well. And so we can kind of tell, are they these Venus-like planets maybe? Are they Earth-like planets? It's going to be a real challenge. This is kind of pushing, pushing the edge of what James Webb can do. But for planets, we're going to be able to tell the difference between these kind of things, and that's key. That's how we move forward. Of course, the one kind of caveat I don't normally mention, but for, for some, of, some of you here, I'll find amusing. The biggest problem to doing this it's the same as the, our problem this evening is clouds. <laughs> if we have clouds, we, 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 can't, we can't get a great spectrum of the planet. Uh, 
clouds. They just look the same at every wavelength, basically. James Webb's going to struggle with clouds just like even e as you move further into the infrared, clouds become less of a problem. But it's for, for the kind of key wavelengths like water here, um, and even at CO2, is going to be a problem for. So the, the uh, James Webb, uh, it, it's going to go do all this and then go much, much redder than this. Yeah, but, but, but a lot of the kind of key data is in this kind of wavelength range. And this is the kind of the wavelength range that Hubble uses as well, which is re redder than we can see, but not particularly far into the infrared. Okay, so my last slide, I just kind of wanted to say where we're heading and what the future is. So we're learning about planets. We're going to study them with James Webb. Hopefully, we're going to start to learn about what the atmospheres on these planets are all absolutely like. But our real goal is actually imaging planets, not looking using kind of a secondary method, looking for light blocked from a star, but taking an image of the planets themselves. So we're designing experiments and, and techniques and instruments right now in NASA, both at Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and other places things that will enable us to block out the starlight and see the planets themselves. We call this direct imaging. And that's our goal. And if we're fortunate, if we get to build them within the next 20 years, we might be able to take images not all that different from that, from this, looking for pale blue dots around our nearest stars. All right, I'll leave it there. Thanks. So, uh, and, and I'll repeat the question. So, has there been an initial allocation for web for exoplanets? Um, absolutely. So, um, people who built the instruments get time called the Guaranteed Time Program. There are also something called the Early Release Science Program with James Webb. Um, guaranteed Time Program and the Early Release Science Program. The goals of those are really to kind of check out the instruments, push them to kind of their limits, and see what we can do um, so that when we start really moving forward and using a lot of time on web, we, we can use it in the most efficient way possible. Um, a lot of the early release science is, is going to be doing exoplanets, going to be doing transiting exoplanets. Um, the two, that, that, that system called L9859, which is the three planets, uh, so far two of them are scheduled to be amongst the first James Webb observations. So TESS found them about less than a year ago. We already got them scheduled and planned for James Webb um, because Tess, this is TESS's role, to find these best planets for James Webb. Um, as TESS finds more planets, those things are going to rise to the top very quickly of, of James Webb's uh, observing time. Our, our, our hope and estimate is that roughly 25% of James Webb's time will be used on studying exoplanets. <coughs> Yeah, so the questions are, are, are planets more common in different parts of the galaxy? We, we've looked into this in, in as much detail as we can. Um, most of the planets we find are in our local neighborhood. Kepler looked a little bit further um, away from us, but not towards the center of the galaxy, kind of perpendicular to the center of the galaxy. Um, there's a technique called microlensing that does probe planets in the center of the galaxy, but the planets it's sensitive to is quite hard to compare with our other methods. But from what we can tell, there's not a strong distribution, uh, d difference in, in, in frequency in different parts of the galaxy. But there is a dependence on, on the, the composition of the star. So some stars have more kind of heavier, heavier elements um, than others. And by heavier elements, I mean anything that isn't hydrogen and helium. So even you know, lithium, boron, these kind of stuff. Um, so some have more than others. And those with more heavier elements seem to form more giant planets. Um, we're still not certain on whether they form more rocky planets. And the effect isn't that strong. We know of rocky planets orbiting among the, the stars of the least heavy elements in, in the galaxy. So they do happen, but there's a slight tendency on, on one place or the other. But it's, it's not a strong effect. Planets are everywhere we look, we find planets. Is there a difference in the way you see these 
sunset and sunrise as the planet uh, transits? So, uh, uh, as the planet transits, you know, it, 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 it um, moves in, into the limb of the star. We call that an ingress, and then it leaves the limb. We call that an egress. Um, that, the duration of that ingress and egress is extremely short. It, it's, you know, a few minutes. Um, and most, the planets we're really interested in are those that we can just about detect. That means we're using the whole transit just to be able to get our signal. And so in that few minutes of ingress and egress, typically we, we just simply don't have enough data to do, do much with that. There are things you can do, do with that. You can do kind of nice timing experiments. Um, you kind of get an independent measure of how, roughly how far the planet is away from the star. Um, and you can kind of solve some of Kepler's equations to teach you about the eccentricity of the orbit. Um, but often that's extremely hard to do. Oh, so it's on the ingress and egress of the um, fuzziness from atmospheres. So, so, so Kepler and TESS just use a uh, single wide band, so you don't have any light information. Um, if you had enough signal to noise, maybe you could do something like that. But the, the other effect happening is that um, as you look at the disk of a star, if you could resolve that star, or even if you look at the sun, it's brighter in the center than it is at the edge. We call that limb darkening. Um, the f yeah, so, so, so well, so, so st stars, they, they look brighter at the center than the edge. Um, the sun, you can see that nicely in the images of the sun. The physics of limb darkening is extremely complicated and quite poorly understood. And so the effect of trying to find an atmosphere as it's having ingress, our, our knowledge of the physics of stellar atmospheres isn't good enough to, to, to be able to distinguish that from errors in our understanding of limb darkening. Yeah, so, so the, exactly right. The question is about um, the number of transits you measure in order to learn about a planet. Um, you notice that tests, we only find very short period planets. Kepler, we find them a bit longer. That's because we, we typically have the rule that we want to see three transits um, in order to detect a planet. To just to be sure, if we see one transit, we have no information on the orbital period. If we see two, well, we're not certain. We're not just seeing two different planets. Three, we can kind of uniquely say that, that is one planet. Um, but that does limit you on, on kind of the orbital periods you can detect, uh, you know, to a third roughly of your observation length. Um, with Kepler, though, we found some extremely long transits. So the duration of the transit gives you some constraints on the orbital period. Um, and so some of these we expect to be thousands of days long. Um, and then with TESS, for example, we've, see, we've been able to, some of the things we've seen, one or maybe two transits, we'll be able to go and follow up from the ground and see more transits. So that enables us to go a bit further. Um, but really, you know, we're, we're right now just probing the inner planetary systems. Um, most, almost every planet we know would orbit interior of the orbit of, of Mercury. Um, in fact, one of the oddities perhaps of our solar system is why don't we have a planet interior of Mercury? It seems statistically we probably should have um, something in there. And so that kind of raises questions of, well, maybe there was something there and it's gone away. Um, and, and that's kind of a nice, I like that kind of taking what we've learned from exoplanetary systems and applying that to our own planetary system to kind of say, well, what's strange and what's unusual and how did we get that way? Oh, uh, how far on the edge of the bell curve is our own planetary system? We're not particularly unusual, but we're not particularly normal either. Like, there are so many parameters in that make up a planetary system that every planetary system is unusual in some things and not in others. Um, but on most things, I don't think we've found anything that makes us extremely unusual. But we're, there are several things where we're on the kind of 5 or 10% frequency. But none of the other planets we've discovered so far. Well, so with with other techniques, we know of planets very very similar to Jupiter. Not all of them. No, we know we know of true.
planets that genuinely look similar to Jupiter on many year orbital periods. We know mo- Kepler found planets on many year orbital periods. Um, so we, we cert- not everything we've found is closer in, but you know, about 80% are, are closer in than, 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 than Mercury. Yeah, so so it, the question is, it, it would life and and them go the speed they go around the star. Absolutely. Um, so we I didn't kind of go into it, but there's this concept of the habitable zone. That's where simply where you're not too hot, not too cold. Um, the habitable zones kind of what we use is to define where we think we could find liquid water on their surface. Uh, those parameters are used because um, all life on Earth needs liquid water at some point during its life, and it would have to be on the surface for us to detect it. If it was un- beneath the surface, we wouldn't simply wouldn't be able to detect it. Um, things, almost everything we've found from from tests and are going to find is going to be interior to this habitable zone, so too hot. Um, not all of them as hot as this planet with molten surface, but many of them perhaps more like Venus, uh, runaway greenhouse um, uh, effect, and and you know very very inhospitable environments. Any other questions? Are we good? Well, this has been awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate it. It's it's such a cool topic, and and, uh, Dr. Martin as well. Um, Thank you. Thank you both for coming out. And we're not totally done. We're done in here, but there are hopefully some scopes still set up. Uh, We can hope for a little, a little hole to look through. But you can certainly ask a lot of questions to the folks that uh, took the time to, to set them up. So uh, thank you all for coming out, though, and, uh, and uh, we'll see you next spring for Astronomy Day.